And indeed, during the four years I spent as Australia's ambassador to Israel from 2013 to 2017, the scar that this shocking crime left on Israel and its body politic and its society was still highly visible to me. Rabin was a phenomenal individual. He led a phenomenal life. Despite his modern incarnation as a peacenik, Rabin was anything but. He was a hard-nosed general and a patriot who nonetheless recognised that Israel's ultimate security was better served by peace with its neighbours rather than continual armed struggle. This is what led him to recognise the Palestinian Liberal Liberation Organisation as a political actor, notwithstanding the fact that the PLO's campaign of terrorism had killed hundreds of Israelis. It was for this which he was awarded the Nobel Peace, Nobel Peace Prize. Rabin wrote to the rabbi, I know that there is no long-term answer to our security problems and to our coexistence with our neighbours other than peace. For the sake of our children and grandchildren, we cannot forfeit this historic opportunity. As the member for Wentworth correctly outlined, these were events that shocked Israel, they shocked the Jewish people, they shocked Australia and they shocked the world. And as this, notion, this motion notes, Prime Minister Paul Keating moved a condolence, po condolence motion in this House on November 23, 1992, which was then seconded by then Opposition Leader John Howard and carried with bipartisan support. Prime Minister Keating also flew to Israel and attended the Prime Minister Rabin's funeral, an act that reflected not just Australia's and Israel's deep friendship at the time, but Australia's genuine sadness at the time and its admiration of the character of Yitzhak Rabin. As Prime Minister Keating said to this House, Yitzhak Rabin was a remarkable individual. Mr Rabin came to the view cautiously, almost reluctantly, but I believe irresistibly, that the cause to which he had committed his life, that is Israel's survival and security, was now best served by a sustained effort to negotiate a settlement with the Palestinians. This did not represent any change in his fundamental beliefs, but he had the imagination and the courage to recognise that military superiority alone could not deliver lasting security for Israel. We, like you, are people, people who want to build a home, to plant a tree, to live side by side with you in dignity, in empathy as human beings, as free men. We are today giving peace a chance and saying to you, enough. Let us pray that a day will come when we all say farewell to arms. We wish to open a new chapter in the sad book of our lives together, a chapter of mutual recognition, of good neighbourliness, of mutual respect, of understanding. We hope to embark on a new era in the history of the Middle East. The fact that Rabin was killed by a person who shared his faith and his homeland was a particular tragedy. Rabin had this idea that you don't wait for peace to come, rather you make peace. On the night he was killed, people were chanting, don't say the day will come, bring the day. That, Deputy Speaker, is the legacy of Yitzhak Rabin. To the member for Isaacs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Yitzhak Rabin was one of Israel's greatest prime ministers. He stands in the same company as renowned Labor leaders like David Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir. But not only that, Rabin's courage and integrity in that role make him stand out as one of the great global leaders of the past generation. In today's world in particular, Rabin's legacy of leadership is clear. During his time as the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, Rabin provided a compelling example of what national leadership looks like when the role is embraced by a person of courage, integrity and a commitment to facing the unvarnished truth of the challenges before them. In all these matters, Rabin demonstrated national leadership that is the polar opposite of the example provided by the ideologically blinkered and populist rulers of many nations today. Rabin's legacy seems even clearer today than it did at the time of his murder 25 years ago. One of his great strengths was his willingness to face the truth of the world and of the challenges it posed for Israel. It wasn't that he didn't want a larger state incorporating all the lands mentioned in the Torah. It was that Rabin had the courage to face the reality that another nation, the Palestinians, held a yearning for those same lands, and not only that, 
that justice required their claim to be accommodated to. It was that Rabin had the courage to tell his nation that painful compromises were necessary, a message that was particularly difficult for the Israeli settlers to accept because their ties to those territories were both genuine and deep. Rabin had the courage to truly lead rather than to merely follow. But I'm proud that support for the State of Israel as a vibrant and democratic nation and for Rabin's vision of a just and enduring peace with the Palestinians remain areas of bipartisanship in, his, in Australia's often bitterly divided parliament. I never had the honour of meeting Prime Minister Rabin, but as a friend of Israel and as a friend of peace, on this 25th anniversary of his death, I echo the words of President Clinton, who farewelled his dear friend with the simple but resonant, Shalom Haver, goodbye friend. <laughs>